If you caught our last video about geothermal heat energy, you'll know there's an awful lot of it right under our feet in the Earth's crust. The challenge is to get at it in a safe, environmentally friendly and economic way so as to produce a large scale transfer of heat into a liquid that then turns into vapour and moves across a turbine to drive an electrical generator which in turn provides extra power for national electricity grids. And many of you who watched that video quite rightly pointed out that large centralised power stations like these aren't the only way to utilise geothermal energy. For over two decades now systems have been in operation that allow individual homes and offices to produce their own micro-generated energy from the very patch of land that surrounds the building. The system is called a geothermal heat pump, but you've probably more often heard it referred to as a ground source heat pump. I think it's fair to say that the industry has been kept quite low key over the years and take up has been relatively slow in some parts of the world, largely due to the perception of high upfront costs. But the outlook is now changing fast, just like pretty much everything else in these unprecedented times we're all living through. The International Energy Agency found that almost 20 million households around the world purchased a heat pump in 2019. And according to analysis by consultancy firm Global Market Insights, worldwide sales are set to exceed $68 billion by 2026. And you and I could be benefiting from a 40 to 50% saving on our home heating costs, plus a hefty government subsidy, depending on where you live. So is it a good idea? How does it all work? And how can we all get a slice of this particular green energy pie? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. Energy use in buildings accounts for more than 17% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. And in somewhere like the United States, between 50 and 70% of all energy used in the home goes on heating and cooling. Different fossil fuels are used to heat and cool buildings in different parts of the world. Many countries rely heavily on gas, but oil-fired heaters are also still in widespread use. The one constant that can be relied on in every part of the world, though, is the fact that the temperature of the ground directly below us is far more stable than the temperature of the air around us, which is subject to all the vagaries of the ever more extreme weather conditions. That means it's generally cooler than ambient air during the hottest days of summer and warmer than ambient air during the colder months. And that basic fundamental physical property is what makes ground source heat pumps such a simple and effective solution. Here's how they work. A mix of cold water and antifreeze is pumped through a ground array of energy absorbing pipes getting constantly warmed by the ground's low grade heat as it circulates. The warmed up mixture then gets fed into a heat exchanger, otherwise known as an evaporator, where it transfers its energy to a secondary fluid with a much lower boiling point. And that fluid then turns to a gas which gets compressed to increase its temperature still further. The hot gas then flows into a condenser where it dumps its energy into a space heating system or even to provide the hot water for the building if required. Once all that energy has been transferred out of the gas, it turns back into a liquid and goes through an expansion valve at the end of the cycle to reduce its pressure and temperature back to the starting point. It's a completely closed loop cycle, so the fluid just goes round and round, absorbing energy from below and dumping it where it's needed. Not all homes and buildings have huge expanses of space around them, of course. In those cases, rather than winding the energy absorbing pipes around in a horizontal array about a metre underground, they can be sunk about 100 metres vertically downwards, like this system being installed by a company called NGO out in California. For each kilowatt of energy consumed by the system, four kilowatts of heat energy are generated, effectively reducing the cost per kilowatt hour by 75%. In hotter countries that normally use air conditioners during the summertime, the stable ground temperature will actually be lower than the hot summer air. And that means the whole cycle can be reversed so that excess heat from the ambient air in the building can be transferred into the system and sent back through the cycle to be dumped into the ground via the pipe arrays, turning a heating system into a very efficient cooling system, saving between 20 and 40% on the electricity bill for a traditional air conditioner. In most cases, the ground source heat pump is combined with a more traditional water boiler 
to ensure there's no risk of the home lacking heat during extreme weather events. But even if that boiler is heated by fossil fuel, there is still a large reduction in CO2 emissions over the lifetime of the installation because the vast majority of the work is done by the heat pump at most times of the year. And better still, if the fossil fuel boiler is replaced with an electric boiler fed by a renewable energy tariff, then those CO2 emissions are even more drastically reduced, which of course is the main object of the exercise. Up in Sweden, where the northernmost regions are actually inside the Arctic Circle, geothermal heat pumps have become a standard alternative to district heating in many buildings, as the owners have found that installing and running their own setup is actually cheaper than paying the cost of the communal system. According to the Swedish Department of Geology, in 2016 there were more than 300,000 domestic geothermal heat pump systems in use across the country. Most of them use that combination of the ground source heat pump and backup boiler running on grid electricity that I mentioned earlier. One of the early challenges of this setup was the demand on the grid during peak usage periods. You see, to optimise cost versus efficacy, the heat pumps were generally dimensioned to provide about half the power demand, which actually equates to about 90% of the energy use. But during very cold days, which are not uncommon in Sweden, these combination systems were using three to four times more power per degree as the heat pumps reached maximum power and the electric boilers were kicking in. And that was causing a very unwelcome spike in demand on the national grid. But new heat pump systems are now fitted with very smart inverter technology which can handle full power heating demand. And that simple addition has resulted in lower energy bills for the consumer, less marginal electricity demand, and greater available capacity on the grid for distribution to other energy users. All in all, a much more sustainable solution. It's well worth checking out Robert Llewellyn's excellent recent video over at the Fully Charged channel looking at Moonstone House in the UK, which generates more energy than it uses and is actually fitted with both horizontal and vertical geothermal heat pump systems. According to this article by Molly Lempriere, published on the Current News website in September 2020, here in the UK, while decarbonisation of electricity has steamed ahead, it seems heat has often been forgotten. The sector generates about 37% of total UK carbon emissions when you add in industrial processes, so Lempriere argues that now is the time for action if the country is to hit its net zero target by 2050. But while the technology is now mature and well proven, Governments have not been willing to provide the sorts of subsidies and grants that are really needed to kickstart the transition for most individual domestic consumers. The power of the fossil fuel lobby is still extremely strong, despite the economic kicking they've endured during the lockdown period. Globally, that industry still receives hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies and tax breaks to keep their products looking competitive against established and now cheaper renewable alternatives like solar and wind. And they exert great influence on lawmakers to keep renewable incentives to a minimum. Despite that, there was a glimmer of hope in August 2020 when the UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced the introduction of the Green Home Grants, a £2 billion fund to drive home improvements. Amongst other technologies, this includes heat pumps, with the government covering up to two thirds of the cost for 600,000 households. The Green Homes Grant is an upfront payment, but it's capped at £5,000 which doesn't go a very long way towards the cost of a well-installed ground source heat pump system. There's also a parallel UK scheme called the Domestic Renewables Heat Incentive. The RHI is designed to help those who install eligible technologies claim back the majority of the cost of the installation over a seven year period. But if you claim both incentives, the Domestic Renewable Heat Incentive is reduced by the amount of the Green Home Grant to prevent what the government calls double funding. The details of eligibility and applicable rates are pretty complicated, so to help with navigating the small print, I contacted the company that installed the solar power system on my home back in 2017. They're called ISO Energy, and they're the UK's most experienced consultants and installers of renewable energy systems. I asked them to run through some numbers based on my fairly typical three-bedroom Victorian terraced house with a garden out the back. First and foremost, ISO advised that a horizontal system isn't suitable for a small garden like mine, so they base their numbers on a borehole installation. A 9 kilowatt system, including the cost of drilling the boreholes, all the internal componentry, and a full size hot water storage tank, from first survey to full installation and commissioning, comes in at about £26,000. 
a retrofit here in the UK has reduced VAT rates of 5% instead of the normal 20%, so we still need to add another 1300 onto that to take the total to just over 27000 But I also explain that the domestic renewable heat incentive can earn the owner of a system like this as much as £4,000 a year for the seven years. So you're looking at a payback time of about seven years, which is actually slightly quicker than the payback on the solar power system that I've had since 2017. The obstacle, of course, is that the homeowner has to pay for the system up front and claim back the incentives afterwards. And not many of us have got the best part of 30 grand kicking around for a rainy day. These sorts of incentives will obviously vary depending on whereabouts in the world you live. But the technology has been embraced in almost every corner of the globe, in hot climates and in cold climates, because of its remarkable ability to maintain a stable ambient interior climate by effectively equalising air and ground temperatures. The challenge, as always, with paradigm shifting technologies like this, is the cost of investment in infrastructure. And as usual, we find ourselves with the eternal triangle of public perception, commercial caution and government leadership. These three things can either be a self-reinforcing mechanism or a precarious house of cards. If the right level of government incentive is put in place, then consumers will see the value of converting. And that will entice more investment into the sector, which will increase competition and drive down prices, which in turn will attract more and more people to purchase the systems and so on and so on. Sounds a bit obvious when you say it out loud, doesn't it? But it's not happening quickly enough at the moment and it needs to accelerate fast if we're to stand any chance of meeting the United Nations target of global carbon neutrality by 2050. If you've got views on this one, or of course, if you have any direct experience of installing and running one of these systems, then dive down to the description box below and share your thoughts there. That's it for this week. Thanks to one of our channel patrons, Bjorn Jonsson, for providing some of the research information for today's video particularly around the Swedish example, and of course to ISO Energy for their help with the UK cost examples. Do have a quick look at the website and the app if you haven't already done so. And I must just give a shout out to some new supporters of the channel who've joined our Patreon page since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Robert Knowles, Paul Raggett, Kate Evans, Mike Franklin, Michael Della Rata, Daryl McKinnon, Tony Dobson, Andreas Down, Mitch Rundle, Gordon Johnson, Michael Baker and Eric Kroger. And of course, big thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. You can support the channel at our Patreon page, where you can also exchange contacts and ideas with other patrons, get exclusive monthly news updates and have your say in content by taking part in monthly polls. You can find all of that at www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And of course, you can hugely support the channel absolutely for free by subscribing and hitting that like button. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest videos, then make sure you hit the little bell icon too. Dead easy to subscribe. You just need to click down there somewhere or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.